you very much, Peter, and good evening, everybody. I assume I'm perfectly audible everywhere. Is that fine? Good. Thank you. Come and hover with me in a helicopter above Southwood. What do you see? At first glance, it looks pretty formless, doesn't it? Just another vast suburban sprawl. Could be anywhere, really. It almost looks like a caricature of a suburb, a stereotype. Standard three-bedroom housing stock dominates, sliced and diced, row upon row, so similar as to appear homogeneous from this height. Unrelieved by much vegetation, unlike most people, though there are thousands of front lawns and backyards down there, many with swimming pools and a few playing fields and parks dotted about. Yet, if we were to swoop low over Southwood, low enough to glimpse the lives being lived under all these red roofs, low enough to sense what's really going on here, we'd get a very different impression. Southwood, like every place of human habitation, is a rich and complex cultural phenomenon. Yes, it's one of those much maligned suburbs. But aren't the suburbs where most poems are written? Most cups of sugar borrowed, most flowers grown, most dreams fulfilled, most passions stirred, most sexual relationships consummated, most babies conceived, most marriages celebrated? It's the suburbs where most parents feel those primitive surges of joy swelling like silken banners in the heart. The suburbs are where faith is most often tested by experience and where the most painful lesson of all, that love's work is hard work, is usually learnt. Suburbs are where the joy of sex is most often experienced and its disappointments most often faced, where most intimations of mortality are first detected and where a feeling of contentment, yearned for yet unexpected, most often descends on people. This is not because suburbs are better or worse places to live than anywhere else. All those things happen in country towns too. They happen in inner city terraces and apartments, in caravan parks and fishing villages. But the suburbs have the numbers, which is to say most life happens in the suburbs. Well, that's uh, a few paragraphs from the opening of the new book, The Art of Belonging. Uh, it's a book of social analysis about what's happening to communities and neighbourhoods around Australia. But throughout the book, I've illustrated it lavishly, not with pictures, but with stories from a fictitious suburb which I've created called Southwood. Check your postcode book, there is no Southwood. Uh, I'm sure there are many echoes of Mossman in Southwood and there are some features of Southwood that you won't want to own as Mossmites. But Southwood is an example of something that I think is the most important thing to know about human beings, which is that we are social animals who not, not just like to live in communities, but need to live in communities. Just take a look at how most of the humans on the planet live, cheek by jowl. Cities, towns, suburbs, villages. This is our preferred way of life. There are hermits. You don't know any because they're hermits. Uh, generally speaking, we, we act like so many other species on the planet that is, we live communal. We're herd animals. It's in our DNA. Neuroscientists are now saying to us that uh, the centre for cooperation uh, can be identified in the brain, but the centre for competition doesn't exist. Competition is something we have to learn. So here's the deepest truth about human beings. Not as we're so often told, that we are ruthlessly self-interested creatures, desperately competing with each other to get our own way and capable of being aggressive 
and even violent if someone stands in our way. Yes, that's in all of us too, that's there. But the much deeper truth about us uh, is that we are born to be part of something communal. We are born to be neighbours. Uh, we are born to belong to communities. But of course the other deep truth about human nature is that communities don't just happen. Uh, I detect more than a hint of pride in the way the mayor talks about Mossman and, and other people tonight have talked about Mossman. And not surprisingly, uh, given the history and the culture of this suburb. But suburbs like this and communities anywhere don't just happen. And they don't necessarily survive once they've been created. So here's another deep truth about us, that there's a kind of symmetrical imperative about human nature, which is that we need communities to sustain us and nurture us and protect us, and those communities need us to sustain and nurture them. So it's not just, it's not just sad, but it's serious when you hear people say, as you so often hear around our major cities now, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, increasingly the, the smaller cities and regional uh, towns as well, people saying, we don't know our neighbours. Or, I feel a bit like a stranger in my own street. Or, the neighbourhood doesn't seem to function quite the way it used to. That's become, that, that we don't know our neighbours has become almost a cliché of metropolitan life, not just in Australia, it's a Western phenomenon. And it's so persistent. I hope it's not true of you, I hope it's not true of your neighbours that they don't know you. Um, but it is so persistent as a theme that it seems to me it's a symptom of something very significant that we have to understand about what's happening to our neighbourhoods and communities. Uh, and that something is that over the last 30 or 40 years, Australian society, like Western society in general, has been undergoing such profound change, social, cultural, economic, technological change, that our society is being reshaped in a particular way. Some sociologists refer to it as the atomization of society or the fragmentation of society. If you look at the big trends that have been reshaping our society and put them together, you're looking at a picture which does suggest increased pressure, perhaps unprecedented pressure, on communities not to function the way they used to, on neighbourhoods to be more atomised, uh, for people not to feel as though it's important to know their neighbours. Now, I don't want to detain you for long tonight. We want to have some conversation and then you want to get into the serious work of the evening. But I want to just take a couple of minutes to remind you of what some of these changes are so that we can quite fully comprehend why fragmentation is an increasing risk and what we have to look out for if we are, as I guess everyone in the room is, passionate about making neighbourhoods into communities. Let me just run through a few of the sort of key uh, changes that have, that have been contributing to this changed picture. Uh, our pattern of marriage and divorce in the last 40 years has undergone a revolutionary change. Uh, up to about 30 years ago, only 7 or 8 percent of Australian marriages ever ended in divorce. And today, the Institute of Family Studies tells us about 35% of contemporary marriages will end in divorce. Unrecognisably different situation. Now, we're not here to have a seminar on divorce, uh, but simply to note that when an institution like marriage undergoes such a change, and when divorce starts to be to seem commonplace, where only about 60% of the marriages that take place in Australia this year will be first marriages, uh, obviously that has an impact on the stability and the cohesiveness of local neighbourhoods and communities. But marriages are not just disruptive, oh, sorry, divorces are not just disruptive 
for the partners who split or for their extended families or their friendship circles, uh, but also for the communities that they belong to. And of course, for kids. We live in a society now where a million dependent kids, about 20% of the dependent child population, live with just one of their natural parents. About half a million kids are engaged in a weekly or fortnightly mass migration from the home of one parent to the home of the other, the custodial parent to the non-custodial parent, usually. This is pretty new for us. We haven't had generations of being used to this kind of thing. A mass migration of half a million kids is very disruptive for the kids, for the parents, uh, and for the micro-communities that those kids are moving in and out of. And while we're talking about kids, let me mention a second major uh, disruptor of community life, and that is the plummeting birth rate. Now, the birth rate is not at this moment plummeting. In fact, it's picked up slightly in the last couple of years. Very, very slightly. People are talking about a mini baby boom at the moment. Well, uh, that's all right if you shout mini and whisper boom, uh, because what's happened is the birth rate has staggered up from 1.7 babies per woman to 1.8 babies per woman in the last few years. This does not constitute a boom. The replacement level for a birth rate is 2.1 babies per woman, so we're well below that. If it were not for immigration, we'd gradually die out at this rate. Uh, and we know what a baby boom is. We had one in the 15 years after the end of World War II when the birth rate was 3.6 babies per woman. We're operating at exactly half that at the moment. I'm not inclined to call that a boom. Why do I mention this? Well, if you think about your own childhood, and perhaps if you're a parent, uh, the childhood of your kids. Uh, it, it generally turns out that children act as a sort of social lubricant in local neighbourhoods. The kids get to know each other in the street or in the school bus or in the playground and gradually their connections create networks uh, between their parents and, and um, other members of the community. It starts with the kids and the families follow. That's the normal pattern. So when we're dealing with such a low birth rate, something very significant changes. That social lubricant is in shorter supply than it used to be. In fact, to put it in perspective, relative to total population, Australia is now producing the smallest generation of kids we have ever produced. The smallest footprint, the quietest voice of any generation of children in our history. So they're not there doing their job. Uh, in such large numbers as they used to be. We have to compensate for that, and of course we do. If you want to amuse yourself sometime, take a look at two graphs. The graph of the falling Australian birth rate and the graph of the rising level of dog ownership in Australia. Uh, and of course we know, because people are now quite explicit about it, that the, the rapid increase in dog ownership is uh, people taking on a dog as a kind of child substitute. You know that they're doing it. I, I was told recently that, that um, couples without children who require a dog or even a cat refer to them as their fur children. Uh, it's a term I haven't yet heard directly, but I'm told that's now in use. Uh, but they give them human names. Have you noticed that there's been a big change? We used to give dogs doggy names, and now the dog is called Nigel. <laughs> Uh, and so people say, well, we get to meet our neighbours when we go walking the dog. We go to the dog walking park or even just walking the dog on a leash. Uh, the dogs start playing with each other and so the, the dog owners get to know each other rather in the way parents used to. There is this problem though, about having to remember whether Nigel is the dog or the owner. Uh, but anyway, we can, we can solve that. Uh, so that's a huge change. A couple of other changes I want to mention. The rise of the two-income household, which has been dramatic in the last 30 years, uh, is another great social phenomenon. We could, we could have a whole seminar on the rise of the two-income household, but typically now in Australia where there are two or more adults living under one roof, uh, they will all be working either full-time or part-time in about uh, 27 and 80% of cases. Why do I mention that? Well, in a two-income household, uh, when it gets to the end of the week, uh, 
everyone's been very busy. Levels of patience, energy, uh, are in shorter supply than they used to be. People don't have the time or the energy for nurturing the neighbourhood to the same extent. They're shopping or they're catching up with household chores. Another huge uh, household change that's had a big impact on the life of communities all around, again, not just Australia, but, but uh, Western society, is the rapid shrinkage of our households. It's been happening uh, slowly, been happening for 100 years, but it's accelerated in the last 30 years. In the last 100 years, the Australian population has increased fivefold. The number of households has increased tenfold. So in other words, we're creating households at twice the rate we're growing the population. Uh, in other words, our households are getting smaller. The average household in Australia now is 2.5 people, heading, the Bureau of Statistics tells us, for an average of 2.2. And the single biggest household category in Australia is the single person household accounting for about 27% of all households projected within the next 10 years to account for 30% of all households. Put the single person and the two person households together and you're well over 50% of all households. If you think of the typical Australian household as being mum, dad and three or more kids, well these days what you're describing there is the eccentric fringe. The mainstream is a person living alone or two people uh, living uh, as a couple. That, that's where, in, in, obviously there are more people living in multi-person households, but in terms of the household statistics, uh, the big story is the single person household. Now again, that's a huge subject, we could talk all night about why there's been this dramatic rise uh, in the number of households with just one householder, and what the consequences are. Very hard to generalise, there are many pathways into solo living and there are many experiences of solo living. Some people have sought it and love it and see it as a symbol of independence and freedom, stay in your PJs all weekend, eat baked beans out of a tin, no one is going to criticise you uh, and that's symbolic. Uh, other people experience it as desperate loneliness and they've been pitchforked into it through divorce or bereavement. Uh, and want to get out of it if they can. But depending on their age, they may be locked into it and never quite adapt to the fact that they're living alone. So sometimes it's freedom, sometimes it's loneliness. The risk of loneliness, of course, is greatly enhanced when we have approaching 30% of our households being uh, solo householders, which is why when you draw up a list of major contemporary social issues in Australia, and again, the same in Western Europe and North America, high on the list. A, 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 a topic we wouldn't have even put on the list 30 years ago, high on the list is loneliness. So here's a huge challenge to anyone who's interested in making neighbourhoods work, like communities. We need to make sure that all those people who are living alone, not necessarily permanently, there's heavy traffic into and out of uh, solo households, but all those people need special attention, they need special care. We need to be very, very sure that we're not leaving someone behind uh, when we're creating neighbourhood events and activities. Social uh, isolation is a terrible experience for most people. It can easily lead to feelings of social exclusion, which can easily lead to feelings of alienation. This is a warning to the rest of us. We all heard that terrible story uh, just before Christmas uh, in, in, uh, in Sydney, in another part of Sydney, where a man was discovered dead in his house uh, and he'd been there for three months. Um, now, tragic that there were no family or friends who noticed that, but where were the neighbours not noticing that someone had appeared uh, for three months? Well, a couple of other obvious things to mention. We've become a more mobile population. Um, Australians now, just like Americans, move house on average once every six years. So the, the stability and the cohesiveness of local neighbourhoods is, to some extent, threatened by this high rate of mobility. 
I was talking about this in uh, Geelong a couple of months ago and, and a woman in the audience said, in our street, most of the people who are moving in now are renters and we know they're only there for 12 months. Is it worth bothering to get to know them? I think you could guess my answer. Yes, yes, they're neighbours. Even if they're only there for 12 months or 6 months, uh, they're part of our community for as long as they're there. Car ownership has taken a toll on footpath traffic and therefore on the extent to which we're likely to bump into each other incidentally, accidentally, uh, those little contacts that uh, feed the life of a local neighbourhood. Uh, and there is of course one other factor I should mention, you perhaps think uh, I should have made it number one on the list, and that's the information technology revolution. The fact that we have so enthusiastically embraced all the new modes of information technology uh, has produced a paradoxical situation. We now say we are the most connected we've ever been in history. People are exchanging messages uh, more or less continuously. Um, and yet, this technology makes it easier than ever for us to stay apart. It's so brilliant, it's so clever, it's so convenient that we are inclined to use it at the expense of the time we spend with each other. Now there's a whole chapter in the new book on online communities. Uh, I noticed there was no one getting a book signed representing the Moss Online Community Group. Um, I'm heart up by that. Um, but, but there are people who's, who think that their social life is happening Online. There are people who think they're falling in love online. The good news is that in about 90% of the cases, people who've fallen in love online when they meet and find there is no chemistry at all. It still does count uh, being in the same place at the same time. Um, but there's a, in, in, the, in the book I've quoted a, a, a large number of research um, findings on this, and they're all contradictory. At the moment, this is also new. You can find research to, to prove anything you want to prove about how this is wonderful, uh, how this brings us together and solves the problem of loneliness or how it's terrible and keeps us apart and uh, people who spend hours a day trawling through Facebook find that a depressing experience, etc. So take what you like out of all the research, but there are a couple of very obvious uh, things that this does point to. Um, one is that we have begun to blur the traditional distinction between data transfer and communication. We used to think that communication was something you did like this, face to face, where the richest part of the encounter didn't come from the words, but from the facial expression and the tone of voice and the rate of speech and the posture and the gestures and the ambience, the situation. All of those things communication psychologists will tell us all of those things contribute at least 50% of the meaning that we take out of an encounter. So when we go online, all that's gone. All we've got is the 50% or less of the potential communication that's just there with the words. Uh, that seems to me to be a qualitatively different kind of encounter. But more and more, people are using it as a substitute for face-to-face. Uh, well, let me stop there with my lightning trip through uh, 40 years of social change and just, just pause to say, isn't it pretty obvious when you put all that together, what the impact would be? Whether we're talking about the IT revolution or the divorce rate or the birth rate or the shrinking of the household, put all those, and they all point in the same direction. It's a bit harder than it used to be to maintain the stability and the cohesiveness of local neighbourhoods and communities. Edith Cowan University a few years ago published uh, what I think is one of the saddest pieces of research I've ever read. It was a national survey and they concluded that only 35% of Australians said they trust their neighbours. Now what does that mean? It surely does not mean that most Australians are untrustworthy as neighbours. Surely what it means is we don't know. Neighbors. We don't spend enough time nurturing that special relationship called neighbour, which is very different from that other special relationship called friend or family member. Neighbour is a particular category. And if we don't nurture it, the neighbor, I mean, everyone's neighbours are odd in some way. We're all odd. 
but if we don't get to know the neighbours, uh, they will just seem increasingly odd, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll begin, as so many Australians apparently do, to feel as if we can't trust them. Now, we know that's not the way we're meant to live, as I've already suggested. That denies our fundamental, essential character as social beings. Uh, we're meant to live in communities. The fact that communities are under threat uh, of fragmentation means that there's some interesting things. Um, one thing is, notice we grabbed on to the word village. Uh, village has now become one of our favourite words as though it's the dream of how we think a neighbourhood should be and as we're losing it we'll plant the word village on everything. Boston Village. Well, it's not a village, it's a suburb. Uh, Camaray Village, they've got a big sign up uh, at the shopping centre in, in Camaray. Imagine any kind of cluster housing for people in retirement that wasn't called a retirement village. Uh, even high-rise apartment blocks, which I'm sure in a hundred years, people will look back on and say, well, that was a mistake, wasn't it? That's not how humans are supposed to live. But the high-rise apartment block, some imaginative developers are now calling vertical villages, uh, a kind of contradiction in terms. So that's one thing that happens. Another thing that happens is when people feel as though the community is a bit under threat or they're not really connected the way they'd like to be, they become obsessed with privacy, with, with security. Uh, and that, uh, and, and that, that reinforces the sense of individualism, increases our obsession with things like our entitlement uh, or our personal happiness as being the paramount thing. Well, that's, those are not good signs. Uh, one of my psychological heroes, Carl Rogers, who many of you would be familiar with Rogers' work, he's written beautifully about human nature. And Rogers, towards the end of his working life, uh, said that uh, whenever any of his clients had come to a full realisation of who they are, it was always to realise that they belong somewhere, that they're part of, they've got, there's a social context that actually defines them, that who they are in isolation, in the navel gazing or staring into the mirror sense, seemed of, of little consequence. The crucial contributor to personal identity is a sense of social identity. So recognising that, and in the context of all the things I've been saying, it's pretty clear that we are being called on in the year 2015 to compensate for a whole lot of social, cultural, economic, technological changes that would have the effect uh, of uh, keeping us apart unless we recognise the danger of this and focus on ways to get back together again. In other words, communities are human relationships and like all other human relationships, they need work. Marriage needs work, friendship needs work. Uh, fail to see your friends and you pretty soon don't feel like a friend. Well, communities are like that. So how do we, how do we compensate? How do we make it happen? And this is, to my mind, what is so absolutely brilliant about this gathering. It was very moving when I was inscribing the books for various organisations to get a sense of the extraordinary diversity of organisations represented in this room, each of them playing a crucial role in making these neighbourhoods, because of course Mossman is too big to be art neighbourhood, but there are many neighbourhoods, to make these neighbourhoods function more like communities and to give people who live here, whether they live alone or in a house with five kids, uh, to give them a stronger sense of belonging to the place. Now we all need that, but we need encouragement to make it happen. Of course we need local government to do the right thing, to provide parks and cycleways and libraries, uh, shopping centres, uh, street cafes, all of these sort of things that we now love, that encourage us to make incidental contact with each other. But of course we have to go further than that. We do need organisations that will bring people in, will encourage them to join, to become part of the place and through becoming part of the bridge club, or the church, or the bowling club, or the RSL, or uh, all those other organisations represented here.
uh, to feel through the sense of belonging to the group that we belong to the place that we are actually part of this neighborhood. But of course it's not just uh, individuals needing to cooperate and work together to bring this about. And again, that's the other brilliant thing about uh, the fact that the Council has convened this meeting, that the organisations themselves need to cooperate. Uh, we need to be more conscious of what we're all doing, uh, what kind of catchment areas we're drawing on, and in particular to see what potential catchment is not being catered for. Where are the gaps? in what's being done in Mosman to give people that sense that they really belong here. Of course, in the end, uh, the key factor in all this is each individual's determination to make this place feel like a functioning community. And that isn't very hard. It does involve things like remembering to smile when you pass someone on the footpath. Uh, and we're getting out of the habit. Uh, it's one of the things that Sydney is heavily criticised for that people are making an art form out of avoiding eye contact. You, you don't smile at strangers in the street or they might think you're odd. Uh, I've tried this now as a bit of an experiment in various parts of Sydney. I, I was running early for an event uh, on the other side of the harbour uh, uh, a few months ago and I had about 10 minutes up the street. I just stood on the footpath and as people went by I just said, good afternoon. And everyone ignored me. No one no one, no, not a flicker of a smile, I mean, the, the determined avoidance of eye contact. I suppose it was a weird thing, it is a man with a clipboard <laughs> saying good afternoon if you've seen it before. But still, in plenty of other parts of Australia, uh, it would be remiss if someone passed you and you didn't say hello. We need to remember that and we need to remember uh, to train our kids to do the same thing. Well, my time's up. Um, we need to have some conversation about this. I just want to say one other thing. Um, a few years ago, I did a study on why people live where they live. And I'll never forget a particular group discussion that I conducted with a group of young mothers in the suburb of Mascot. We all know where Mascot is. Um, on the perimeter of Sydney Airport, virtually, surrounded by light industry, not a beautiful suburb, a pretty unprepossessing sort of place. And I'll never forget. Uh, this group of young mothers saying with great enthusiasm, why would anyone ever want to live anywhere but Mascot? As though this was it. And they said, imagine wanting to live in the eastern suburbs, disparagingly, or the North Shore, dismissively. Mascot was heaven for them. Why? Because they, they had created the dynamic of a village. Their kids did know each other, they looked out for each other. They knew what neighbour meant, and they were playing that role, which meant that mascot, of all places, really felt like the place where they belong. Well, let me, uh, let me conclude by just reading a couple of sentences from the end of the book, having given you a bit from the beginning. Every community has its differences of opinion, its social divisions and its cultural tensions, which is simply to say that every community is both diverse and inescapably human. If you want to master the art of belonging, you'll need to accept the imperfections and deal with them. And the best way of dealing with them is to overlook them. There's a lot of tolerance, a lot of forgiveness in the art of belonging. Well, why would you do it? Well, we, I don't think I even have to raise that question to people who are as motivated as you are uh, to make a community function. But if you do need a reason, there are a couple of very really good reasons. One is, Social interaction turns out to be the best possible way of keeping dementia at bay. Uh, crosswords won't do it. Crosswords are a nice ritual. If you enjoy crosswords, do them. Uh, but as you get older, social interaction is what keeps the brain alert and, and keeps dementia at bay. But also, we have to remember that the way we live in Mosman is not just about Mosman. It's about creating the kind of society that we want to live in. We're very good at bleating about the state of the nation, the state of society. We have to remind ourselves the state of society starts in the street, in the suburb, in the neighbourhood where we live. Dream of the kind of society you want to live in and then start living as if it's that kind of society. But we've been very patient. Um, uh, Mark, I think, is going to...
handle some questions now if you'd like to uh, take them. Session. Do we have any questions of you on any particular areas of the topic you'd like more detail on, more information on? Yes? Through consultation, young people have indicated that they often feel as though older generations and Boston are judgmental of them. What would you suggest to overcome this barrier? And do you have any examples of successful generational initiatives? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and by the way, this is an almost universal cry from younger you know, people about older people, and it's not, it's not by any means just a contemporary problem. It, it has been going on for some tens of thousands of years. Uh, that older people do tend to be judgmental of younger people for all kinds of reasons. Uh, one is that they know these young people have their lives ahead of them and they can do what they like, whereas we're towards the end and you know, we haven't necessarily done all the things, we haven't fulfilled all the potential. So what do you mean by having all this potential still ahead of you? That creates strangely deep resentment in older people. Um, it is a bit of a particular issue at the moment, I think, with so-called Gen Y, um, which is a generation raised in the sort of rather turbulent situation that I've described, the offspring of our most of all standard generation of parents. Uh, a generation who got used to the fact that everything is changing all the time, so we have to adapt, we have to keep our options open, and so on. Uh, and I think older people are a bit envious of that as well. You know, when the GFC threatened uh, disaster in Australia a few years ago, it was fascinating to me, saddening, to hear so many older people say, "Ah, this will teach these." This will teach this younger generation what's what. This is what they need, a good crisis. Uh, failing to recognise that this is a generation that's grown up with uncertainty and was probably the best equipped generation in Australia to deal with a crisis. The crisis didn't come, as it turned out. Um, but that, that, I thought, was very telling. Uh, so the answer, as always, is contact. Creating... I mean, I think it's the responsibility of older people to get to know younger people and, and to appreciate them and respect them. Because after all, we're the older people we're supposed to take these initiatives. But if we don't, go ahead, invite us in. Uh, I think any kind of event where you can bring the generations together to talk to each other informally, to hear from each other, is going to help, um, help break this down. Uh, it happens within families, it happens within a street, it happens on the bus. Um, but we do need someone to take the initiative. And, and I think it's sad to have to say, well, why don't you take the initiative? But if no one else is, then let Mossman youth uh, take the initiative. Uh, uh, create events which are not just for young people, but which are deliberately designed to get the generations together talking. Uh, um, when younger people say older people are judgmental of us, I think they're right. But, but it's not a new story. And the first, uh, the first thing to say is to young people, are you judgmental of older people? Uh, maybe they sense some lack of respect or some um, um, satirising of older attitudes, etc. I mean, we are, we easily fall into those traps, but there's nothing like contact. Uh, thank you. Hugh, uh, one of the things that you mentioned was uh, about local government uh, you know, facilitating uh, communities. And one of the challenges that we have in front of us at the moment as a community uh, is the prospect of various forms of amalgamation. Do you have any kind of views or, or uh, perception of whether that uh, larger councils or smaller councils would be uh, better for developing communities? And by the way, I, I really agree with what you say in terms of uh, building and maintaining communities is a, a huge challenge for, uh, for all kind of groups, whether they're councils, governments, or just streets. 
Yeah. I'm totally, totally opposed to amalgamations, uh, and I recognise the inevitability of it. So it doesn't matter whether I'm opposed to it or not, it's going to happen. Uh, and the challenge, of course, is to make, well, let, let's look at a very big uh, example of what happens. The European Union. Uh, there's, there's a kind of amalgamation. And what is the effect of that? Well, a whole lot of stuff uh, is done cooperatively and, uh, and, and uh, throughout the union. But when the union occurs, the individual identities of the member countries become even more pronounced. So now that they're in the EU, the French are more aggressively French than ever before, and the Italians the same, and the Brits the same, and so on. Uh, and that's not a bad thing, that's just how we are. We are tribal creatures, we do like to have this strong sense of, uh, of identity with our own tribe. Um, so in a situation where amalgamation seem to be inevitable, I think we've got to make sure that the identity of Mossman is aggressively maintained, nurtured, developed uh, within the context of whatever the larger local government area. It almost certainly will mean that there will be less, that, 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 that local government services uh, will be, feel more remote, there won't be the same level of sensitivity to local issues. But that just means there's going to have to be a lot more local action. In fact, I think um, uh, it, moving beyond local government, even to federal government, I think at a time like the present, when I've never known people to be so despairing about the quality of political leadership in the federal uh, area, this actually brings out the best, <laughs> in some ways, in, in people who say, well, it's up to us. I think there's a genuine turning of the tide about the re re reinvigoration uh, of local neighbourhoods and communities, people being more determined to take local action to create what we want here um, because we know there's no magic political wand to be waved. Just, just one more question. Yeah. Um, hi, Hugh. My name is Shanti Clements and I'm principal of Viewpoint. I've been there for six years, but one thing I'm really interested in is your perspective on, on the impact of the working week and the economic stress that parents face. Because I've seen a change in the last 21 years since I've been in education, where uh, working parents were not um, the common, um, you know, <laughs> dynamic in a school. And at that stage, children who were in, let's say, aftercare were perceived as, you know, there's a sort of a pitying sort of quality. Whereas now I'm actually seeing a very positive um, transformation and perception of, of after school care, where we're seeing kids who would normally go home and be isolated because both parents are working, suddenly having community. And with the New South Wales New School Plan, there's a shift in schools in, in only providing an educational um, support. It's really schools becoming a social hub of connection for children. And I'm seeing a greater sense of responsibility for schools. So is this the same embrace for future generations? Um, certainly for us, we, we have a very strong focus on building that legacy where we would like, our, well I'd like to call them our wise elders, coming in and being more active mentors. But um, yeah, I'm really keen on your perspective on the impact of the extended working week. And it's not so long ago in the 70s we had more working a 40 hour week, yes. and now that's very rare. Thank you. Yes, thanks for that. Uh, it's a huge issue, but, but broadly, uh, I think schools are more and more. Uh, actually, the two things that there's a chapter in the new book about hubs, neighbourhood hubs, uh, the two big ones I think uh, that we have to recognise that are going to play an increasing role in our communal future are schools and libraries. Very interesting how libraries have become a sort of ideas market uh, in most neighbourhoods. Most libraries are undergoing massive development both in facilities and staffing as we realise they're no longer just about borrowing books but they're about meeting and interacting, adult education, kids play groups, uh, story time, all, all this sort of stuff. But schools similarly, I think we are beginning to understand 
that schools, because of the nature of social change, schools are no longer about children going and sitting in class and learning and then going home. More and more, it's before school and after school care, more and more the parents, because they're so busy and a bit frazzled, uh, are looking to the school to do things that we traditionally thought parents should do. Um, I did some research a few years ago on why parents, why so many parents send kids to private schools. Uh, and the answer was for values and discipline. Over, over the two overwhelmingly uh, sort of top items on the list. And I thought it's a bit sad in a way, but it's a reflection of what you're saying. That here are parents saying, it's all too hard for us, we'll pay the school to do this. The very things you would have thought traditionally parents would take on as their responsibility. So, I mean, one of the implications of what you're saying is, I think we, we don't yet fully understand the extent to which the school is going to become a, a neighbourhood hub. I think it's going to be not just bringing in the wise elders to do mentoring, so, but I think there's, you know, as the population ages, there are going to be more and more people in retirement or semi-retirement who would love to be called in to help the slow readers or coach a bit of sport or, or even join in the music class. Always wanted to learn the violin, now I can, you know, at the age of 68, uh, whatever they are, uh, sitting there with the kids. Great for the kids, great for, you know, this thing about intergenerational tension as well. Um, but I think also, increasingly, we're going to recognise that schools will have to take on some responsibility of educating parents as well, about parenting, about what's going on in the school, understanding the nature of the curriculum, all this sort of stuff. All of which, of course, puts more pressure than ever on the staff of schools. I think we're, as a community, we're going to have to start being much more alert and sympathetic to that. Thank, thank you. you. You all join me in thanking you for coming along to this.